Hi everyone. I'm in the middle right now of changing out the digital readout on my mill. Consequently, I don't have an XY readout right now, so I figured this is the perfect time to make a video about milling techniques without a digital readout. First and foremost, you have your dials available to you. Different machines are going to read in different ways, so I'm not going to get into that. Maybe you've got an inch machine, maybe you've got metric. Uh, in this case, it's a bridge port, and if you go one full revolution, that's two hundred thousandths of an inch. Maybe your machine is only one hundred thousandths. Whatever it reads, you just have to figure that out and make your movements based on that information. On all machines, you're going to be able to move this dial and zero it in any particular spot. In the case of the bridge port, you undo this knurled nut and then you can move the dial around. Now when you're using the dial, you need to watch out for backlash. And backlash is the play between the screw and the nut that drive the table. So you want to make all of your movements in one direction. Say this is your zero. Make sure that all of your movements are in one direction so you don't have to worry about the backlash. If you change direction mid-movement and then start your, your dial readings, then you're actually losing where your zero is and it's not going to be a reliable movement. Another thing about using your dials is you've got to make sure that you keep track of how many revolutions you've gone when you're traveling long distances. If you lose count, maybe you've moved two inches, maybe you've only moved 1.8, maybe you've moved 2.2. Uh, either way, those could be disastrous consequences. One thing you'll definitely want to have on hand if you're going to do a lot of milling without a DRO is a selection of dial indicators and mag bases. Now this indicator has a 2 inch travel and that's going to be really handy for this particular project. I've got a second indicator in MagBase as well and uh, this one I'm going to use on the Y axis because I don't have to travel as far and it only has 1 inch travel. You shouldn't underestimate the power of table stops when you're doing work without a digital readout as well, especially if you're doing repetitive work. Now bridge ports and bridge port clones have a stop right here in the front of the table. Uh, you can't really see it because I have my limit switch for my x-axis power feed on top of it. This is the stop that's actually provided with the power feed and this section right here, the smaller diameter, will trip the limit switch but you can actually still run the larger diameter up against the solid stop. If you don't have a power feed, you can make stops for the table. This is uh, one that's similar to what would have been on the bridge port originally. Mine didn't come with them. Uh, but I just made this out of three quarter inch key stock. And I just cut a little boss in there to sit inside the channel and a matching T-nut. Uh, that way it stays nice and straight and that would bump up against the stop. Before I put my power feed on, I had actually made a really large heavy duty stop uh, for repetitive work. And it's nice and long, you're not going to shift this around. You've got two screws in there holding down a single T-nut and a nice fat boss there for the channel. If you had a bunch of repeated features, for instance slots, you could have one of these on either side of the central table stop. Then your blocks would be setting the extreme ends of the travel. So one on this side and then you move the table until it bumps into that side and you're going to get consistent lengths across the board. It also wouldn't be difficult at all to incorporate a dial indicator holder into one of these blocks. And that would just bear against the central stop. Uh, you might have to get a little bit creative in how you're going to hold it, but uh, it's not difficult to do at all. The part I have to make is a bracket for the x-axis reader head and I've got to cut a couple of slots here and a couple of slots here. So let's talk about a few techniques that's going to make this job easier. Since I'm changing my setup midway through I'm going to go ahead and use a vice stop so I can bump my part up against it and I'm going to show you a quick trick using either a marker or a grease pencil that is going to help you keep track of your original zero. That's one of the hardest things about machining without a digital readout. One really indispensable trick when you're machining anything on a mill without a digital readout is to put a little mark in between the saddle and the table. Of course, you could also do this on the y-axis as well, or the z. Now, you could use a Sharpie marker, of course. 
I actually really prefer using a grease pencil or a china marker like this. Uh, it's the kind you can get at art supply stores. While it's not necessarily as visible as a Sharpie, I mean it's somewhat faint, uh, but where it really shines is that it's very, very easy to wipe off. With a Sharpie, you have a tendency to need to break out some acetone or some kind of solvent in order to get it off quickly. Now, a long time ago on the Home Shop Machinist forum, I actually saw a post from someone that had glued a long, thin scale on the front of their table like that. Obviously, you would want to glue one on that ran the entire length of the table. But then they could just put a mark at a convenient denomination on the scale and then see exactly how far they had traveled from their original zero. Okay, so I'm set up to find my edges. I've got my part bumped up against the vise stop so I won't have to find this edge multiple times. And I'm going to use the fixed jaw side of my vise to find the y-axis, which is what you should be doing anyway because that jaw doesn't move. And there's my kickoff, and like I said, uh, the dials on a bridge port are 200 thousandths per revolution. Remember, you've got to compensate for half the diameter of that tip on the edge finder, which is 100 thousandths. So I'm just going to go ahead and set my dial to 100 thousandths, so when I move in my 100 for half the diameter of the tip, I'm on zero. So now I've moved my y-axis handle up to zero, and I'll be able to move in to the correct dimension and I'll go ahead and uh, move to that now. I'm going to make it 3 eighths of an inch, 0.375 inches from this back edge and then I'm going to set my 1 inch dial travel indicator to zero there uh, so that I can just get my 3 eighths long slot. When you set this up you want to do it in such a way that the indicator is going to be very visible to you. Uh, you don't want to have to lean over the machine so uh, this is going to take a little bit of finagling. I'm going to do this off camera and I'll just show you the results. The way I've got it set up is my mag base is on the underside of the ram. That seems to be the most stable spot for that. I tried putting it on the column itself but it's just a little too uneven so I went with the nice flat surface right here. The indicator is bearing on the back side of the vise jaw and you want to really make sure that the plunger of the indicator is as straight as possible otherwise you can get errors in your measurement. Another thing you're going to want to look for is that you're actually bearing on solid metal back here because there's uh, tapped holes in the back side just like these tapped holes here. Those holes are there for mounting the vise jaws in the outboard position for gripping larger work pieces. Now I've got to find the x-axis location and we're going to do the exact same process. I prefer to use only one of the x-axis handles uh, rather than swapping between the sides. You can try to do it where you zero one side and then take out the backlash and zero the other, uh, but that introduces a whole host of possibilities of screwing up. I've got my dial zeroed. I'm going to go ahead and put a mark on the table like I showed you earlier, just so I know where my original zero is. I'm using the marker trick because of the shape of my part. I've got to cut a set of slots on this face and then turn the part and cut another set of slots. That means that I'm going to have to come back to my original zero which right now is the spindle center line over the left edge of the part. I'm also going to go ahead and set up my dial indicator with a two inch travel for this set of slots. Uh, this set is only an inch and an eighth apart so that's within the travel of that indicator. I just need to figure out how I'm going to set that indicator up. I need to have it either on the table and touching something on the saddle or on the saddle and touching something on the table such as the vise. Again this is going to take some finagling so I'm going to go ahead and turn off the camera and I'll show you my setup after I figure out what I'm going to do. So the way I've got it set up is the mag base is sitting on the flat part of the saddle. That definitely seemed to be the most solid option. Uh, and my dial indicator is bearing against the side of the vise. Now this is ground on the Kurt vise, so that's a perfect option. Uh, again, you want to make sure that this is as straight as possible both this way and this way uh, to avoid any kind of angular errors. Now the nice thing about setting it up like this is no matter what you do with the height of the table, uh, this is going to move along with the vise, so I won't lose my location. 
The way I have it set up with the y-axis, uh, that's not the case. If I drop the table, the indicator comes off the vise, which is a little less than ideal, uh, but that was the most solid way of mounting it. So I'm all set up to make my first slot. Um, I'm actually going to make these a little bit wider than a quarter of an inch wide, which is the size of my cutter, uh, because quarter inch bolts are going to go through this. So I've actually purposely set it ten thousandths too far this way, then I'm going to take a second pass moving ten thousandths the other way just to make sure that I've got a little bit of wiggle room. The mating holes on this are actually hand drilled so you know I need a little bit of wiggle room to make sure this thing's going to fit. So I can look at my dial indicator for the y-axis and make this first cut. That's 250,000 long. Now I'm looking at the dial indicator for my X and I'll move over to 10,000 on the other side of zero. And I'll make my cut back to my original zero. That's one down. Uh, I have enough travel on my X axis indicator over here. Uh, that I can move over my inch and an eighth to the other hole location. So let me go ahead and do that. If you don't have a dial indicator set up, of course, you could just do this with your dials. Okay, there it is. And again, I've gone two thousandths too far that way so that I can get a wider slot. I'll make my first pass there and then move twenty thousandths over so I've got a little bit of wiggle room. That's one side done, now for the other. And you probably can't see this on camera, but I've moved too far back that way just to compensate for the backlash, and I'm reapproaching my mark that I put on my saddle and the table earlier. So I know that as I'm getting close to that mark, I can go back to my dial and look for my zero, which is right there, and my mark does indeed line up. I can look here, and it certainly looks like the spindle center line is lined up with the edge of the part. Now the spacing between the two slots on this face is actually longer than the travel of my indicator, so that's going to be kind of useless. That means that I'm just going to have to rely on the dial. The good news is the screws that go through this will be smaller than a quarter of an inch, so I'll be able to just make the slot and that's going to give me plenty of wiggle room. I won't have to move to one side and the other side of zero. Let's go ahead and get started. I've gone ahead and made this slot just a little bit longer than these uh, just to make sure that I've got plenty of wiggle room for attaching this thing to the reader head on the digital readout. I've gone ahead and re-zeroed the dial on my x-axis to be centered on this slot because I'm not going to have to move back. That's just going to make it easier to count the revolutions so I highly recommend that if you don't have to keep track of your original zero. I have to move 2.675 inches from this location to the one over here so it's just a matter of counting the rotations on the dial. So this should be right where the second slot needs to go. Let's go ahead and cut it. So there we are. We've got two fairly accurate slots cut in each face. Now this probably isn't anywhere near as accurate as you could do with a digital readout, but if you take enough time and care, you can produce very accurate results this way. One last thing that I want to mention is if any of these were holes that were going to be tapped, you would really want to do each of the tapping operations at each hole before you move on to the next one. So you would move to the first location, you'd spot drill, drill, chamfer, and tap, and then you'd move on to the next one. The reason being is if you spot drilled all the holes and then moved back and drilled all the holes and then moved back again and chamfered them all and then moved back one more time to tap them, you're introducing so many possibilities for errors that you're almost certainly going to make one. 
So just make it easier on yourself. It'll be more tool changes, but you'll have much more accurate results that way. This has really been one of the most requested videos that I've had, and it's about time that I got around to doing it, because I know there are a lot of you out here who don't have digital readouts on your milling machines, and I'm hoping that this video gave you exactly what you were looking for. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them down in the comments. I'll try to address them in a later video. Please consider hitting the like and subscribe button if you haven't already. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.